So this is an ancient this is a map, the North Pole, and it's ugly truth. This is a North Pole is Arctic, right? And Arctic is a South Latin. Check out this newspaper article from 1913. Hope to solve Earth's final puzzle, Icy Crocker Island. And then you see this map of like the North Pole, and right next to it, the theoretical location of Crocker Land, okay. a lost continent. What that was this man? To be right next to the North Pole. This is the early 1900s. It's a time when the world map has been thoroughly explored and documented. There were just a few places that were still kind of blank. Yeah, a -a -a. The high north, an icy ocean that was incredibly difficult to get through. But people thought there was this North Polar continent. Unexplored for now, but people wanted to get in on it. They wanted to see what was up here. And in fact, a couple explorers roaming around this area had reported seeing land up here. It created this frenzy, this I understand land. Was there a lost polar continent up near the North Pole? I want to show you the story of how this all went down. It's the story of the explorers who decided to go into the most impossible terrain on Earth just to explore it. And it led to a passionate rivalry between these two dudes with big egos. Huh? What's that? Big photos and smear campaigns. And it was kind of like the space America. race of the day. A race to see who could be the first to get to the top of the world. To who got guess their powers. Who discovered not all. Okay, so let's get up to speed on what we're talking about here. The Arctic is kind of anything above this line, but we should ditch this map. This is the Mercator projection, which I kind of have thoughts on. Where the Mercator fails is its representation of size. It Box. everything in the north and south, and it's just not going to be good for this story. So we need a better map. Check out this map. This one's way better. Watch. This beautiful map I have had for a very long time, and I'm finally going to be able to use it for a story. Uh -huh. Look at that beauty. Man, this is not bad. Man, this is just such a beautiful map. Just gorgeous. This is what we're going to use to tell the story. This is the top of the world. But anyway, before we go on, I need to say thank you to three. Uh -huh. Try it out. Okay, the North Pole, the top of the world. Reminder that this is just one giant ocean. But the reason it looks like this is because it's frozen. You can't just like sail through it. And yet many explorers had this uh, There's no plans. They wanted to reach the North Pole. The arbitrary place on our planet that's just a bunch of ice sheets sliding around. Where all the longitude lines come together. The place that we just decided with map was the top of the Earth. You know, the North Pole where Santa lives. That's what we're talking about. That is what the explorers wanted to like get to. So why attempt to reach an arbitrary bit of ocean that's super impractical and risky? Because it's there, dummy. We're humans. We don't ask questions like that. Just we just have to go. go. Earlier attempts. People have been trying to get up here for centuries, trying to figure out what they would find. Maybe if they got through the ice, there would be some warm water ocean here. Maybe there'd be new really? routes over the top of the globe. By 1845, explorers were making custom ships. They were reinforcing the hulls of warships with thicker wood that could take on the pressure of the ice. And they would go and explore. And they didn't find any useful shipping routes, but they did find people. These people, the Inuit, knew a thing yeah, They want to find an ice wall. They knew how to build shelters out in the ice. They made kayaks and parkas. They used dog sledges to get around. Oh, and these dog sledges? You went to the discover the artist, not plant. But let's not get distracted. That's for a totally different story that I'm doing on Greenland. The point is that these American and European explorers realized that any North Pole expedition with a chance of success would need to rely on Inuit guides. So it's the late 1870s, and we start to see the first serious attempts to finally reach the North Pole. Every attempt being its own version of crazy. Let me show you some of these. All of these little lines are different explorers and their attempt to get okay. here to the center, to the North Pole. And each one was insane. Like this guy who intentionally floated from Russia, 
got mm -hmm. his boat stuck in the ice on purpose and then let the ice, which is always moving around, sort of drift okay. around and carry him with the hopes that it would like carry him to the North Pole. But instead he just didn't like, go along with the car and eventually got like spit out next to Svalbard. I mean, these guys were climbing like 30 foot ice ridges. They were facing off with polar bears whose territory Hello? this is. I mean, these guys are out exploring in some of the harshest conditions ever in the name of adventure? Exploration? Like, that is why they were doing this. They became heroes for kids back home. But anyway, this is all just backstory. Our story that I really want to tell you about starts now, and it has to do with this guy, Robert Peary, Arctic explorer who is obsessed with getting oh. to the North Pole. Yeah, I mean, just look at Robert Peary's portrait. That's pretty cool. Peary was an American Navy engineer who was dead set on becoming famous. Once writing a letter to his mother saying, quote, Remember, mother, I must have fame. Like, that's who this guy is. He and his obsession with being famous is a huge part of this story. Yeah, he just want to be famous. So Peary is out yeah, so. exploring the Arctic. He makes Greenland his hopping off point. That's sort of his home base. And on his second expedition, he breaks his leg. Luckily, in his expedition, he's got this greeny doctor who comes and helps mend his leg. And while his leg was healing, they stayed up in the Arctic yeah, for doctor. six months. And during that time, this greeny doctor, Frederick Cook, learns a bunch of skills for surviving in the Arctic. He even starts picking up the Inuit language. Okay, so eventually Peary's leg heals and they head back down south. And Peary is like pretty impressed with the greeny doctor who's now learned all these new skills. He's like, wow, Cook, you're incredible. We'd love to have you on our next mission here in the Arctic. But Cook wasn't into it. He didn't want to be some footnote in history. He was feeling confident after his one expedition. Yeah, and want to do alone or... out on his own yeah. as an explorer. Peary was kind of like, okay, cool, Cook, like, have fun trying to be an explorer. <laughs> You're, like, super ungrateful for everything I've taught you. Like, okay. And thus, the seeds of tension were planted between these two. Old school Peary versus newbie starry-eyed Cook. Both with big egos and both willing to do what it takes to show that they were great explorers. So they go their separate ways. The newbie doctor turned aspiring explorer, Frederick Cook, sets out on his own expedition back to the Arctic, feeling super confident. <laughs> this this trip doesn't get any adventure music. It was a total failure. Like they barely made it to here and then they had to like turn back and abandon their ship and like, ah, oh, Cook. And Peary is like loving this. While Cook was getting owned in the Arctic, Peary continues to kill it as this engineer turned Arctic explorer who pines to be famous. He's busy going to Greenland and bringing back three giant meteorites. Who goes out on an expedition and comes back with meteorites, like from space? Peary, I mean, you're the real deal. I guess he found something. He writes a book about his adventures and starts to get heralded as the greatest Arctic adventurer of their day. I mean, look at this face. This guy's kind of a badass. True story, I was in Greenland. Oh, bad, I know. And tried to take a photo just like this. Okay. Okay, so back to Cook. He doesn't give up. He's slowly getting better at this whole explore the Arctic thing. He goes south to Antarctica and goes on another expedition that goes horribly wrong. But this time Cook is ready. He meets the challenge and he makes it out alive, leveling up immensely in the process. By 1898, Peary moves to Greenland, like kind of permanently, and makes his focus on getting to the North Pole. Like that is his dream. He is training, he's recruiting people, and he starts to go out on attempts. He wants to be the first person to the top of the world. And this is where we kind of start to see Peary's true colors. Like as much of a badass as this guy is, um, you do a little bit of research and you realize he's a bad asshole. Oh, and, like, okay. There's so much to say about this, but little sampler here. He brings back six Inuit. Like the Sapa Columbus. End up dying, oh. and there's this whole insane story that you can read about in the citations. But yeah, he's not a great guy. He cheats on his wife with a 14-year-old and has a kid with her. Uh -huh. and there's this guy, his number two, Matt Henson. Henson was like one of the best non-Inuit dog sled drivers in the world. He even learned to speak the Inuit language, something that Peary wasn't even able to do. But Peary described him as, quote, his assistant because he's black and goes on to give him basically no credit for all of his achievements. So yeah, Peary's kind of an asshole, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't also an incredibly skilled, determined explorer. 
I mean, he stays up here for four years, refining his technique to get to the North Pole. He obsesses over gear and designs custom sledges and even creates this like perfect water boiler. And he keeps going back mm -hmm. to after attempt. And each time some disaster occurs, and they have to turn back. In the process, he loses eight toes to frostbite. I'm on ten, maybe. He gets closer and closer and finally decides that it is his time. So he builds this custom ship. He mounts a massive expedition and he goes out. And on what he hopes is his last expedition, he claims he to by a piece of land uh -oh. sticking out of the ice. This would later go on to fuel the land. a continent up here. All these newspaper articles I was showing you about, like, is there a continent near the North Pole? But anyway, on this expedition, he still doesn't make it. The furthest he was able to get was here, just 200 miles from the North Pole. But he had to turn back. So wait, is that it? Is Piri giving up? He lost his toes to frostbite and he didn't make it to the North Pole? Wait, just pause on Piri for a second. We'll talk about what happens next. But first, we got to get back to this guy, Cook. What's Cook up to? Well, it turns out that Cook continued to level up, getting more and more experience getting more and more famous. He goes to Alaska, trying to be the first to summit Denali, which is the highest peak in North America. And he comes off the mountain saying that he made it to the top. Whoa, Cook, nice. we're no longer playing in the minor leagues. He's a legit explorer now. He's even elected as the president of the Explorers Club in New York. By 1906, he's kind of like a big thing. the explorer scene. And soon he's sitting in the bougie National Geographic Society dinner in Washington, D.C. A dinner that was put on to actually honor Peary for all of his Arctic explorations. Okay, so this is where it gets juicy and like the tension and drama really starts to like rise. Because during this dinner, Alexander Graham Bell, the guy who invented the dinner, no big deal, he gets up and is like, yeah, 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 Peary's cool and all. I know we're like celebrating him here in this dinner, but what about Cook? Let's hear from Cook, a man who's gone to the top and the bottom of the earth and the largest peak in America. So What's he up to? He gets up and toots his own horn at this dinner that was supposed to be for Peary. Peary must have been pissed at this moment. Like this was his moment to shine. He was getting all this attention. And who's there? Cook, the, the guy who was like a greeny doctor who's now his rival? but who Peary considers as a hack, like not a real explorer. But now Cook is feeling good. He's no longer a newbie. So he sets his sight on beating Peary to the North Pole. The race is now on. Okay, so I'm going to be this later, I guess. Seven and Cook heads to the Arctic. He gathers a crew to go to the North Pole. There's one other Westerner, got nine Inuits, and a dog sledge team for each. Peary was pissed at Cook at this moment for even attempting to be the first one to the North Pole. And to make things worse, Cook was using a bunch of Peary's techniques and recruiting Inuit that Peary had built relationships with. And doing this all just as Peary was about to head off on a final attempt of his own. So months go by, six months, and then eight months. And now it's been a year, and no one has heard from Cook. Is he dead? Who cares, says Peary. He's getting ready for his own expedition. To the Where's the Cook? Teddy Roosevelt wishing him well on his way. And just like that, Peary and his crew are off, racing to the North Pole. Cook still out there somewhere, and the world wondering, who will get there first? Newspapers start wondering, does he still live? It is a seesaw of doubt and hope. Who may have the story of finding the North Pole, or who may be buried somewhere oh. in the snow and ice? And headlines back then were so cool. Okay. And then, on September 1st, 1909, on this little island in the north, a ragged Dr. Cook appears ashore. He heads straight to the telegraph station and sends this message. Uh oh. It's not bad. This is huge. Nice. Cook says he reached the North Pole and that he found land up here in what a lot of people think is an ocean. Okay, but wait, it's not over. Literally five days later, who shows up on the Labrador coast but freaking Peary? What? Okay. Five days later, he sends his own telegram. Man. And if the past guy stoked enough about Pound the to come back and discovered land and got to the North Pole first, now they're going berserk. This is so juicy. The great rivalry climaxing in this big five day. He can't he can like make this stuff up. So they turn to Peary and they're like, Oh, Cook arrived five days ago and said that he was the first one to get to the North Pole before you did. What? 
He did not just get bested by the cocky newbie that he trained. Oh no. Cook is lying, Piri says. The rivalry between these two guys is hitting a crescendo. And the newspapers, their cartoonists, and their readers are all loving it. It leads to this waterfall yeah. of creating memes. The nice. Rivalry, which at this point was about ego, fame, money, reputation, all playing out in the epic Arctic. The last year, just pay attention to me. I would watch the hell out of this. The true story of two very different men in pursuit of the same goal. My favorite cartoon is this one. It's a puck cover showing the North Pole holding a bag of money with Cook holding a note saying, I saw you first. And Peary holding a note saying, so did I. <laughs> oh, it's okay. so good. Oh. oh, and Cook was super into like gumdrops apparently. Anyway. So now it's like full-blown information warfare between these two. Peary's going out on this like smear campaign to undermine Cook's credibility, saying that he's been lying about all of his accomplishments. He didn't actually summit Denali, says Peary. So then Cook fires back, revealing kind of his snarky side, reminding the world that Peary is this 52-year-old man with just two toes. Oh, and it's awfully suspicious that he didn't take anyone with him who could corroborate the latitude that he was at. Among all these memes and selling of newspapers and the public bickering, the questions still remain. Who actually got there first? Well, mm, wouldn't that be easy to know. go to the North Pole? We can obviously go there now and see what flag is planted there. No, because remember, the North Pole is just a frozen ocean and the ice drifts like miles per day. So huh. That won't work. The only way to actually prove who got there first is to review the evidence from these expeditions, the journals, okay. and the records that these guys kept, and then compare that I mean, they could be lying, though, I mean. To be honest, both these guys' accounts are full of weaknesses and weird stuff. Uh -oh. Like, remember when Peary insisted that there was a landmass up here? Well, a later expedition went out and had this, like, horrendous experience of trying to look for that land, and they discovered that it was not there, that this was totally made up. Uh, Many think that Peary that was up in an earlier expedition to rally excitement to raise money for future trips. So what did that mean? Who actually got there first? Was everyone just lying about everything? Has the North Pole ever been discovered? Well, it would actually be decades of exploration, observation, and analysis before some clear conclusions started to emerge. For this story, we read through books written by scholars who have dedicated much of their professional lives to answering this question. And here's what we can finally say with some clarity. Nice. Peary probably made it to the North Pole on this trip. Academics have debated this, and most say that he came between making it like within a hundred miles to actually making it dead center to the North Pole, just depending on who you ask. And while we're at it, it's also possible that Henson, remember Henson, the number two who didn't get any credit because Peary was probably racist, was actually the first to get there because he was the guy who forged the path for Peary to follow. Meaning it was very possible that the first person to He's step the guy. was a black man. Kind of cool. Okay, but what about Cook? Didn't he start his journey like almost a year before Peary? Did he actually get there first? No, Cook did not get there first. Uh, Years that sucks. revealed that Cook was a liar. Like a full-blown liar. Actually lying. The that he probably made it was like here. 400 Literally miles lying. Literally lying. The North Pole. AKA, he never actually traversed the really difficult portion in all of this. He made it far enough to be able to tell a convincing story, and then he headed back and sent this telegram saying that he made it there first. Whoa, Cook, okay. But at least he's like a legit explorer, right? Like, he summoned a Denali first. I mean, he had picks. Wait, no. Turns out these picks are not the top of Denali. They're actually shots from like 15,000 feet further down. AKA not even the elevation of Denver, Colorado. Like this was a total staged huh. photo that he lied to the world about to say that he was the first one to make it to the tallest peak in North America. Cook was a liar. He had tricked the world and many believed him. Wow, okay. So, I he guess. wasn't full set on being famous, but at least he was a legit explorer who probably made it to the North Pole or close to it first. And Cook, seemingly a decent explorer, was actually just a much better storyteller and a full-blown liar. Uh, but this is unsatisfying because I mean, definitively who was the first person to like 
touch their foot on the North Pole, which is like, why do we even need to know that? Why is that important? Because it is. No one gets the credit without needing to go into all of these caveats, and there's way more caveats than I've gone into here. Instead, this is a story of revelation, manipulation, and media blitzes, of controversy and debate, optics and lying. And instead of seeing a Neil Armstrong, we're left with more of like a couple of Elon Musk types. But I won't leave you there. Let's just say definitively who made it to the North Pole first with no asterisks. In 1926, Roald Amundsen, the man who had previously won the race to the South Pole, became the first to get to the North Pole, undisputed by flying over it. Nice. He to touch the ice, he just flew over it. Just but it was in 1948 that a Russian was the first verified person to walk on the pole, like to actually like put a boot on the North Pole. Can you be the first person to walk on the North Pole? Submarine. went under the pole, which was another first. And submarines are really awesome, and we made a whole video about them that you should watch. Then yeah, finally, I the first that. undisputed person to reach the North Pole by land was a guy from Minnesota. It was essentially the culmination of like a bar bet that got way out of hand. That's a whole other story. But yeah, it was 1968, and with a snowmobile. So it really gives you an appreciation of what Peary was capable of doing decades earlier using Inuit wisdom, his own clever inventions, and a lot of sled dogs. Nice. So today, the question of who got to the North Pole first is not really a question that most people are thinking about a lot when it comes to the Arctic. I went to Greenland a few weeks ago and have been reporting on the changing Arctic exploring how different countries are vying for ownership and influence in this space because this frozen ocean won't be frozen for long. And now it's opening up to new shipping routes, new resources unlocked as the ice melts. But one thing that hasn't changed is how the media treats a story like this. A race, a rival, space. a public gossip fest with big egos hungry for attention, and especially when there's imagery to go along with it. I think we're all eager to believe what we see when it fulfills some deep need to witness the excitement of exploration. I mean, to and today, the people who want to be in the spotlight do so by bickering and boasting about how great they are. And the media still gleefully covers it all. Covering the lies, covering the deception, as long as I mean, there's people a want to see it. and a great image to go along with it. And sometimes that's fact-checked and the truth comes out and sometimes we just never know. Huh, isn't it? Okay. I think that's just a bit of a bit. I guess it's a little bit of a 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 b